Good morning and happy Sabbath. And uh, we're going to open up the word of God to uh, Matthew 13, which will be our scripture reading for this morning. Matthew 13, verse 44. going to be our directive for this morning and we'll be dovetailing off of this verse if everybody is able to open up your bibles and get there matthew 13 verse 44 and it says there again the kingdom of heaven is like the treasure hidden is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Remember we learned a little bit about this last Sabbath? Remember that? What was the field again? The world. Yep. Yeah. Was the world, remember? And uh, what was the hidden treasure? Jesus. No, it was the word of God, remember? The word of God. Remember that? Hold on a minute. Let me get this working. Oh, my goodness. Stop it. Yes. The this, this scriptures, remember? Do you remember that? Let's let's read what Ellen White said about this. I'm kind of using a different format. She, the question was, is what, what is this parable all about? Remember? Ellen White says in Christ, in, uh, Christ Object Lessons, page 104. And you can see it a little bit here on this. Uh, whoops. <laughs> On this, uh, on the screen, if you would like, um, I don't know if you brought your handouts or not, but um, I have, you know, similar right here on the screen if you want to follow along. Um, and it says, this parable illustrates the value of heavenly treasure. Okay, first thing we need to understand is the heavenly treasure. That That excludes everything from this world. A very based understanding of asking that question is, is what it what what I'm doing right now, is it in heaven? So do the do the angels carry guns? So do I need to go out and buy a gun? <laughs> no, not really. The, the, the reason why is because then you're kind of opening up the door for the devil to say, well, you can compromise what needs to protect you instead of asking the Lord. Now I've had this conversation with somebody earlier this week who totally understand the first amendment rights and everyone's right to bear arms and all that. I'm not against it, but you know, I'm with Desmond Doss who went to war, went into one of the bloodiest battles and never carried a gun. What did he carry with him? Gold. We're going to discover that. And he he saved over 71 of his own men. Some of the Japanese said, I, I had my sights right on him and my gun would jam. He said bullets were flying by like bees and not one bullet hit him. And he carried away single-handedly 71 of his own men that wanted to kill him the day before. Wanted to kill him in boot camp. You know what he said? You know, I've been asked that question. He said about carrying weapons. And he said, well, what about your wife? Don't you care about your wife? He says, I absolutely care about my wife. And if anybody tried to harm her, they would wish they were dead. After I got a hold of them. But I won't kill. Because the commandment says, you shall not kill. So this parable illustrates the very, the value of heavenly treasure. You should broaden that brush stroke to everything that you do in your life and the effort that should be made to secure it. In other words, if there's things that I don't know about the heavenly treasures, I should do everything in my power to find out about it. The finder of the treasure in the field was ready to part with all that he had, ready to put forth untiring labor in order, do you see this? in order to secure the hidden riches. 
So the finder of a heavenly treasure will not count no labor too great and no sacrifice too dear in order to gain the treasures of truth. What is that treasure then that was in the field? The treasure of truth. Do you see this? Are you okay with it? Okay. Yeah. In the parable, the field containing the treasure represents the Holy Scriptures. That's where you're going to find the truth. Everything should begin with the Bible. I've had conversations with people in Washington this week where they're like, well, you know, I, I find, you know, I'm making dinner for my kids and shrimp and things. And I said, well, I don't eat shrimp. Well, why don't you eat shrimp? Because it's in the Bible that you won't eat shrimp. Well, I have faith, okay, but where is your faith coming from? Does it begin with you in your self-observation or does it begin outside yourself with the Bible? And said, so regardless of how I love shrimp, oh man, I won't tell you the things I used to do when I was a criminal and stealing. Oh, anyways, I, I love shrimp. I go out of my way for shrimp. Until I read it in the Bible, Lord, take that away from me, man. And he did. Everything begins with the scriptures. All your perspectives, all your life habits, all things should begin with what God says in his word. The word created the worlds, the heaven, the sea, the sky, and you. Therefore, he knows better than me what I should decide what I should carry as a principle of truth. Does that make sense? And she continues, and the gospel is the treasure. The Holy Spirit, or I mean the Holy Scriptures, and the gospel is the treasure. The earth itself is not so interlaced with golden veins. Uh, the earth itself is not so interlaced with golden veins and filled with precious things, precious things as what is in the word of God. Does that make sense? So remember, we were learning about the Laodicean message in Revelation chapter three, remember? Re Revelation chapter three, real quick. We have to go over this over and over and over again because our minds last about three, three minutes at the most. And then everything starts to dissolve. You know, I'm an idiot. I'm telling you right now, I'm a bumbling moron. I I skipped, I I was I flunked kindergarten twice. I never graduated eighth grade. I never I never went to school in high school. I sold drugs while I was in high school. That's all I the only reason why I went to high school was girls and drugs and rock and roll. That was it. I'm a bumbling idiot, but yet uh, the Lord if I ask him, can help me obtain his word in my mind. Does that make sense? You know what? Matthew 13, 44 is so important. I want to follow Matthew 13, 44. I want to get rid of everything that's going to distract me from being able to absorb what the word of God says for me and my principles, that I value everything that comes from the word of God. Even if I'm struggling with it, I still want to know that the word of God is my compass. Does that make sense? So remember what it says in Revelation chapter three, starting in verse, uh, let me get there. In verse uh, uh, 16, I think, oh no, verse uh, 17, I believe it is. Because you say I'm rich and have yep and become wealthy and have needed nothing and do not know you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Boy, we have such a self-preservation about ourselves. And the Lord's like, you guys, you you have you just you, we need to set the self-preservation down. I counsel you, and this is how you do it. He counsels us what? To buy from me gold refined in the fire. This is where we're going this morning. And remember, where did we find out where we buy that gold? Remember, it was in Proverbs 23, 23. I hope you don't mind that we're going through scriptures. I mean, we, we have to obtain our standards and how we understand what God wants from us through his word. So we have to go through the word so we can build a premise. And you can see that we're putting pieces of a puzzle together. 
piece by piece through the scriptures, right? So what is this gold that we're supposed to be buying? Well, Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy the truth. Jesus said, buy for me gold. What is it? Buy the truth and do not sell it. Don't sell yourself short for the word of God. Don't compromise with the world, with the word of God. Don't blend the two together. Does that make sense? Buy the truth and that, in other words, when you get all, when you obtain the word of God from that field that Jesus has provided for you, you should do everything in your power to keep it and don't compromise that truth and sell it. Because we're going to, we're building up a case here to where the Laodicean church, which we are, has a very special time in history that is explained in Revelation 13, which we're going to have an understanding how these two are connected together, all right, about the buying and the selling, okay? So it says there, buy the truth and do not sell it. And wisdom and instruction and understanding. Remember those words right there? Those buzzwords should ring in your bell. Those sound like Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Remember Isaiah 11, 2? Remember what the whole, who is the Holy Spirit? Remember it says the Spirit shall rest upon him. The Spirit of counsel, of might, of knowledge, right? Of wisdom, instruction, understanding. That's the Holy Spirit, remember? And the Spirit has gifts, remember? And Jesus poured out those gifts. And those gifts are the, are, is the seven spirits of God, which is those those. Uh, those identify those those characteristics of the Holy Spirit: wisdom, instruction, understanding, counsel, and might, righteousness. Those things the Holy Spirit is, and He gives it to us to expand our our spiritual gifts. Why do we go to church? Are we going to church just to play church? Do we just come to play church? You know, we come for worship, for spiritual understanding, for counsel, for instruction, right? And, and Paul says it's all there. It's all there to edify the church. Our spiritual gifts should be expanding out there in the field so that they come in and understand that we should, that they should never give up the truth that they discovered from the ones who are supposed to be carrying the spiritual gift, which all together, you condense it all into one word, it's truth from the word of God to edify the church. We're not here to play church. We're not here just because we're here hoping we make it. We're here so God leads us and guides us through spiritual worship, through his praise, through the, through the hymns, and through the word of God. And together we come together and see how God is preparing us in this little church for how it's going to be in heaven. Do you understand? That's why we, we come together because we're all individuals. We all have differences, but just like rocks that are being polished inside of one of those tumblers, we all have to rub against each other in order to be polished, because Jesus wants us to understand that we have to be prepared to be the same down here as he wants us to be up there. So then when he takes us back home to the new Jerusalem, to the new heavens, the new earth, there it, we choose not to live our lives in sin. Because we love him. And because we love him. We love each other. Does that make sense? So back in Revelation 3, verse 18, it says there, buy for me gold, tried in the fire, that you may be rich or refined in the fire. The gold is refined in the fire. And if you obtain this gold, you will be rich. And this is not talking about your Kenneth Copeland golden canisters that you don't have to fly around the country or whatever away from demons that you can have a mansion and 17 cars and 24 garages and so on that's not what this is talking about 
because Jesus is offering this gold. So how do you refine gold? Remember, we were looking for that. So we understood that the harvesting of the gold many times comes from extracted straight from the ground. It has to be separated from other elements. Remember? And then it's put into a furnace. That's how they do gold. That's how they purify gold. So in the parable, the ground is, the, is worldliness. The elements need to be separated to refine or to find the gold. It is a process, sometimes slow, the transformation of the life with Jesus realizes. So in a spiritual sense, the transformation to separate this gold that is supposed to be ours that we buy from Jesus. Sometimes it takes a long time. The transformation of the life with Jesus realizes the based elements of the past life is covering up the great true treasures that the Lord is sifting in order for us to be rich. Does that make sense? And it's a, it's a, it's a lifetime process. It doesn't happen all in one night. In this life, full of Jesus's character, we grow to be purified more and more and more. But still, we don't, we haven't answered, what is this goal? More and more, the sifting process needs to continue. It's a time, it's a process of a lifetime so that this goal can be ready for the purification process. This is just the refining part. But first of all, the worldliness first has to be separated. That's why in Revelation 3, Jesus's first counsel to the Laodicean church is buy from me gold. He could have said, go put the raiment on first, go put the garment on, or go put the salve on first, and then later say, I counsel you to buy from me gold. But he begins his counsel with this goal. There is a step-by-step -step process there for the Laodicean church. And we are the La Laodicean church. First, the worldliness has to be separated in order to even discover the goal. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. Now, remember... Well, I'm referring to Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Page five of the old handout. Page five of the old handout. Ah, thank you. <laughs> so to understand what this gold, what is this gold, the Lord encourages us to buy from him. Do you understand? So we have to have a desire to go buy this gold from him. Not yet. No. Good, good try though. Good try. You'll see. You'll see. You'll see. You're, uh, don't, don't, don't jump the case yet. Don't, don't jump the gun. We need to study the field to what Jesus said is, is to where you buy this gold from. So this is where we, we went, right? We, we went to the, the gold, the scriptures will provide us the answer and, and that this gold we are supposed to buy from Jesus. He says, will make us rich. Now listen to this. Okay. So in order to understand how we buy this gold, let's let's first put this gold together a little bit. Let's let's find some clues. James chapter 2. How do we obtain this gold? James chapter 2 verse 5. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're probably not going to like these <laughs> where where Jesus goes with this. Where the Holy Scriptures goes with this. Because this is sometimes a sucker punch right in our stomach. But it needs to be, it needs to be understood because Jesus is preparing us. Verse 5, James chapter 2 says, Listen, my brothers, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? Right? Listen, brethren, has God not chosen the poor? Remember what the poor was? Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom. Right? Remember what the poor in spirit was? Those who have set their selfishness aside and are asking the Lord, I'm empty. Remember we went to Isaiah 55? Or no, it was, uh, yeah, it was I or Isaiah 60. Let me go to Matthew chapter 5. 
because I put all my notes in there. Matthew chapter 5, Isaiah 66, verse 22. Isaiah 66. Remember what the poor was? See, people think it's a poor, oh, we're just on welfare. And, you know, oh, if we just do the common good thing, then, you know, do the common good. Therefore, hey, we nailed that together and now we're doing good, right? No, the poor in spirit is those who desire that feel I'm still empty. I need more of the Lord and less of myself. I need to find every single corner of the kingdom of heaven and what it means. So when I get there, I'm not shocked. I go, I knew it was there. I read it. I believe it. He showed me. Right? When you're becoming a citizen of the United States, you have to agree to certain things in order to be a citizen. Isn't that right? When you become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, there's some things you have to get rid of. It's the same thing as a United States citizen. There might be some laws in other places like a Sharia law that you can't agree to when you're a United States citizen. And they are not going to let you in unless you decide before you become a citizen to remove that Sharia law from your mind that you promised you wouldn't cut somebody's hand off for lying. Hmm? Does that make sense? Jesus wants us to be prepared before we come to heaven. That means he's not coming to prepare a people. He's coming for a people that have been prepared. Okay? Isaiah 66, verse 2. For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist. That's Jesus, says the Lord. But on this one, I will look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, who trembles at my word, who has humbleness, reverence for his word. Does that make sense? Daniel 3. Let's add some more pieces to the puzzle about what is this gold? How do you obtain this gold? Remember now, James said what? That you may buy this gold by what? Through faith, right? Remember that? Remember what it said there in James chapter 2, verse 5? That uh, the poor of this world would be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who what? Love him. Okay? There's one way to obtain the gold. In order to, you need a contrite heart so you can truly love the Lord. And you have to get rid of the worldliness. Ask him to take it away. When you ask him to take it away, he's more than happy to take it away from you. But look what it says in Daniel chapter 2. Let's build up on this case. Daniel chapter 2, right? I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 3, sorry. Daniel chapter 3, verses 12 through 18, it says there, there, there are certain Jews, these are the Babylonian uh, magistrates, the, sad, uh, the satraps, the, the, uh, the uh, astrologers, the soothsayers, and they're going against these three, certain three, three uh, Hebrew slaves, all right, because they're like, hey, man, they're not doing, this is enmity. You know, Daniel chapter 3 is a chapter of enmity between God and his people and the Babylonian and their people. Does that make sense? You remember what enmity is? Focused hatred, okay? Now, believe it or not, most of God's people in this chapter go for Satan's side. They do what Satan wants, but there's three in this story who stand for the Lord. Remember that verse that we look at who is able to stand? This is part of that whole concept of who is able to stand. This concept of who is able to stand is the ones that will understand how you buy this gold from Jesus. Okay? Loving him, obeying him, having faith in him, contrite heart. You understand? Okay, so next case, next item on the list. 
Verse 12, there are certain Jews who have set over the affair, or who, who you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid, paid due re regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image in which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave, to the, the, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I don't like those names, but... That you, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image in which I have set up? Now, if you are ready... At the time that you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music. Now remember, Daniel chapter 3 is a literal story that has a spiritual connotation for the end time people at the time of the Laodicean church period. This is directly a message from us. Remember, that Babylon is going to use music in order to draw everybody to bow down and worship their gold. That's not even tried in the fire. You don't even have to be tried in the fire for this. You just have to bow down and worship this gold image. Does that make sense? Hey. The golden image is going to be the Babylonian mindset of pagan worship and the hub or the system that brings that into the world, which is already unfolding right before our very eyes, is the Roman papacy. Remember, the Catholic Church is different than the Roman papacy. What does papacy mean? Does anybody understand what that means? It, papacy literally means church state. It's a church state, is it? It's church state. The church and the state. If you examine the papacy at the Vatican, it is a state, a sovereign state with a king who is an ambassador and has ambassadors that go all over the world uh, propagating their interest for their sovereign state. It's the smallest state that contains 1,735 uh, citizens, okay? It is also a church, and it has a god, and his name is Papa. And when he sits down on his throne at St. Peter's Basilica, it's known as Ex Cathreda. In other words, he is infallible. Whatever he says is infallible. In fact, they've wrote uh, doctrines stating that even God in heaven himself will obey the Pope when he speaks ex, ex cathedra. <laughs> so there's, so now you have the understanding of the church state, which is the papacy. The Roman Catholic Church is for the people. The papacy is for the government. The papacy deceives the government. The church is the umbrella that deceives the people. I'm not just making this up. It's in the great controversy, exactly. It's all, it, the, the signs are just so clear right in front of your face. It's, it's un you're unable to deny it, but that's the truth. So this Babylonian mindset, though, here in Daniel chapter 3 is being picked up by the Roman papacy. But here's the thing, that golden image was casted without anybody needing to be tried in it. But listen to this. It says in verse 15, now, if you're ready, at the time, remember the sound of the music, all the music, so everyone will hear this music and they will bow down. And he, he warns them, uh, if you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you will be cast immediately in the midst of the burning, fiery 
furnace. No, that is very key to understanding how you buy from Jesus this gold. Listen to what our example said. And who is the God who will deliver you from, who was able to stand from my command, you three remnant people who stand for your so-called God? When I'm your God, I'm ruling you right now. How dare you, right? Verse 14 or 16, Shadrach, 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 Meshach, and Abednego. I don't like those names. Answered and said to him, now this is key. This is key. This is how you buy the gold. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this is the case, if that is the case, our God, remember what was the case? If you do what I say, good. If you bow down and worship this old golden image, good. But if you won't, I will toss you into this fiery furnace. And they say, if that's the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. What is deliver? Endurance, patience. Remember those words in Revelation chapter 14, 12? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. Is this breaking a commandment if they bow down and worship the idol? Yeah. And have the faith of Jesus Christ. What's the faith of Jesus Christ? You're reading it right here. If that's the case, our God, whom, sir, who, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Oh, we have so much. This is the key word. We have so much faith that we know Jesus will deliver us, right? Oh, 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 no. Here's the whole part of it. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But there's more to the story. You think, what if Jesus doesn't deliver you? Hmm? I know, but we read it. But how hard is it to actually ingest it and internalize it for our own personal struggles? But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. That is the faith of Jesus Christ. Even you know, a little personal disclosure, I'm always one thread away from homelessness. My kids are still amazed that I still have a home. I'm not going to go into all the details, but I'm always one thread away from homelessness. It's only by the grace of God. I can't puff myself up, not even one second. I'm at the total mercy of what God decides. And I have to say, because he saved me. Even if you want me in a trash can, Lord, I'm still yours. If, if you want me to sleep in a trash can, so be it. You, they can't take away my heart and my mind because I love you. And I'm terrible, terrible at showing it. Does that make sense? It's hard to show it to an invisible God. It's hard to show it to an invisible God, but he's not so invisible. <laughs> His leaves of the tree of life are right here. He's promised us so many things. 
How could I let a God like that go? How could he love me so much? But regardless, I know I will never let him go. And that's an oath. Nothing is any more, pre nothing is more precious than knowing that Jesus Christ saved me from a deep, dark, evil hell. This Daniel chapter 3, verses 12 through 18, refer, refers also to what? Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. They all are in harmony. Read it. Remember this. Absorb Daniel 3, what we just read. It, is my expression enough for you to absorb what Daniel 3 was just expressing? Now, you take that very thought over to Revelation chapter 12. And guess what? We have the same thing going on there with those people. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring or the, or the remnant of her seed who what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Do you know what I just read to you there in Daniel chapter 3? What I just read to you right here in, Dan in Revelation chapter 12? And what I'm going to read to you in Revelation chapter 13. Flip right over, just one page over, Revelation chapter 13. Starting in verse 16, it says, he causes. Who is the he? That is the earth beast. That causes, just like Nebuchadnezzar caused those people who are in his captivity to bow down to that golden image, this Babylonian agent pauses. That means forced. He, he compelled, not only compelled, but he, he made them what? All, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on the right hand or on their forehead, and that no one may be able to buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Daniel 3, Revelation 12, Revelation 13 right here, one word. You know what that word is? Enmity enmity remember that remember that remember what enmity is it's focused hatred between the serpent and his seed and the seed seeds remember galatians chapter 3 verse 16 who is the seed paul says that that is christ and jesus christ has a remnant just like he had in Daniel 3, he had a people that represented him who stood for him. And they were what? What happened to those three Hebrew slaves? They were cast into the fiery furnace. What happened to these people in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17? They were cast into a fiery furnace. Were they hunted down? Were they burnt at the stake? Were people fleeing for their lives because of the seed of the dragon? You better believe it. There are certain people who will not worship those gods. Guess what gold is? What is gold? What is it? No, what is it? Gold is faith and it needs to be tried in the fire why ah to test it to test it what was the main question remember in uh 
in uh, Revelation chapter 6. Here's a reference. Since we're in Revelation, let's go to that reference. Remember what Revelation chapter 6, verse 17 says? Starting 16. And he said to the mountain, and, and said to the mountains, those are the people, the rich man, the commanders, the mighty man, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks and the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the faith of, face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. These people are scared of a lamb. So much so that they're asking the rocks to kill them, hide them from the face. And it says there, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? That's the question. How are you going to be able to stand when they tell you you are not able to buy or sell whatever they're selling and whatever they're conscious or whatever they, they want you to buy? Do you see the enmity? Who is able to stand? And in that great day of tribulation and in the day we need to, we need, uh, we need, we'll need a mediator. We need a mediator today to teach us. We need that mediator because we need it today because we're not going to be prepared if we ask for it then. We'll be just like those people in Revelation chapter 6. Too late. Too late. Matthew 24, 13, remember? Who is able to stand? What does it say in Matthew chapter 24? Verse 13. Matthew 24, verse 13. Remember what it said? But he who endures, that is patience. That is who is able to stand. Jesus gives the promise, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. How are you going to endure the end? James chapter one. This is how James chapter one. Let's go back to James chapter one, verse 12. Remember where James is? It's right after Hebrew or right before, I mean, right after Hebrews. James chapter one, verse 12 says, blessed is the man who endures. There it is, endures. So we're on the same page. Temptation, for when he has been approved. So how are you tested? Temptation. Being tried. The man who endures tem temptation for when he has been approved. You know, that's that's when he has been purified. When he has been, when all, when he allows God to take away all the dross, all the worldliness, when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to who? To those who love him. Remember James chapter two, how do we, how do we get this gold? How do we stay rich? By obeying and loving him. And we get tested. Does that make sense? We get tested. And what is being tested? Our faith. The gold has to be purified. Remember Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience. Here is the endurance of the saints. And what is the endurance? The patience of the saints. How are we gonna, how are we gonna be able to stand it? Those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith, just like those three. And those are not the heroes of the story. Do you understand that? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not the heroes of the story. Give me a break. The Hebrew God is the hero. The one that when, she, when, when Nebuchadnezzar looked in that fiery furnace, he said, didn't we throw three in there? And they said, yes, king, oh, live forever. Yes, we did. He says, well, then why do I see four? And one looks like the son of God. Oh, 
That's the hero. You will not be able to pass a test of any sort without Jesus being your hero. Do you understand why this isn't so important? Why this is so important? Do you see that every connection I've given you so far has everything to do with the seventh church period? We are the last church period. Isaiah 43 gives us this, pay, this, uh, this promise. Listen to this. Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 2. It says there, but now that says the Lord who created you, O Jacob. Remember, o Jacob? Remember, if you guys want to understand Jacob, Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 2. If you want to understand Jacob, go back to uh, Genesis 32 onward. Do you understand? And in there, there's even, I think it's in Genesis 35, there's six steps of how to bring yourself back to the Lord. Now, there's your homework. What's your reference again, uh, I think it's I, I think it's Genesis 35. It, get, it literally tells you six steps to how to make your, get yourself back to the Lord. Okay? Now, Isaiah 42. Uh, Genesis, Gen, I believe, you might have to look around, and I will, I will message you if I'm correct. I don't have time to go look right now. I believe it's Genesis 35. Six steps of how to get back to the Lord. It says there, but now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you for, uh, I've called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, how is gold tried in the fire? You shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. That's a promise. You have to walk in that promise. So before the day comes, when all the universe is going to peel back like a scroll and all the world is going to be literally split apart and then Jesus will come in the clouds, guess what? All that is great and fine. I am not there. I'm not here to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus. Did you know that? We're not to be preparing for the second coming of Jesus. By that time, it's way too late. What is time? What is time? Why is there time? Do you know why there's time? Say it again. Right. Do you know that the rest of the universe is not bound by time? Everybody's living in eternity. There is no such thing as time. You know why there's time? Because of sin. God gives us a probation. He said in Genesis chapter 6, I can only stand sin for 120 years. Therefore, I give man 120, 40, or 120 years to live. Because if I let them live forever, sin would last forever. He gives us time. He gave us this gift called time as a probation so we can be tried in the fire so we can say this is our God and he will redeem us. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Amen? In Eden, now listen to this. Wait, let me back up. We have to be tested before Jesus comes. We have to be tested, tried in the fire first. That's why Jesus announces his counsel first would buy from me gold refined in the fire. Because without that, you might as well toss out the raiment. You might as well forget the eye salve. Because you could put the raiment on, you could put the eye salve on, and you have these goggles that just look, you know, like you can just go do whatever you want. And you will be saved. God's going to test you on that. Now listen to this. Speaking of testing, in the Eden, in Eden was the garden, and in the midst of the garden was the tree of life. Okay. Now we're going to unpack a little bit more about enmity. 
the two differences between God's way and then he allows us to choose either his way or anybody else's way. In Eden was the garden and in the midst of the garden was the tree of life and also in the midst of the garden was what? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Let's look at these two trees to see what they mean. They symbolize what lessons we can derive today. The tree of life, as the name suggests, was a source of life. That makes sense? That they, they perpetually were living because they would go to the tree of life. Okay? Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 6, page 69, Ellen White says this. It was only a few generations back from the flood when Adam had access to that tree, which was to prolong life. After his disobedience, he was not suffered to eat of the tree of the life and perpetuate a life of sin. Make sense? In order for man to possess an endless life, he must continue to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Where, where is that? What, what does that mean for us today? Remember? Yeah, that's right. The leaves, you go back to uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 27. Oh, man, I'm telling you, you got to read the end of Ezekiel. It is such a blessing. Such a blessing. Everything, it seems, that is in the end of Revelation is referring off the, uh, off the end of Ezekiel in 47. I think it's 47 and 48, I think, are the last chapters. 47 is phenomenal. Tells you everything about what the tree of life is and the leaves and where it is. The tree of life is not here. It's in the, it's, it's in the sanctuary. Those, those leaves, though, the branches come down off the wall of heaven and the leaves reach down right here so we can pluck the leaves of the Bible. Right here. These are the tree of life. You know we're on probation. The only way we can perpetuate our life is by obeying the word of God that comes from the tree of life. Okay? In order for man to possess an endless life, he must continue to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Deprived of that tree, his life would gradually wear out. What does that say for most of the world? They're not living. They're existing. They're starving. She continues on. Why did God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden that they might not eat of the tree of life? Why would they? That's so mean. What, a, what kind of a God are you? Right? There is doctrines out there. There's philosophies out there in the theosophical society that come with their own answers to the table and say, well, we know why. Because he's an evil God. And Satan was actually one that was trying, or Lucifer is what they call him, or actually were doing Adam and Eve good. They didn't get kicked out is what they say. They, they walked out on their own. And everyone goes, hey, man, cool. I don't have to worry about that no more, right? Really? See how this goes? Why did he cast them out? that they might not eat the tree of life because as sinners, if they had eaten of that tree, they would have had lived forever as sinners. And so the tree of life, representing life, representing the blessings of God, the favor of God was in the middle of the garden. Access to it was simple, but God is a God who believes in love that comes from the heart, not love that is forced. And so every created, intelligent, being has to be tested. That's including angels. God placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil right in the middle of the midst of the garden as well. As well as now, as the, and as well now that that tree, as you can discern from its name, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was set aside by God, not as to be touched, God said to leave it alone. God's precise prohibition is found in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. He said, where God says, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the knowledge, or every tree in the garden, thou shalt, must, thou, thou shalt freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest of it, therefore uh, thereof thou shalt surely die. 
He didn't say, I'll kill you. He said the action of your choices will result in the death of yourself, of you. Separation from God. Now, this is the very last enemy, enemy that shall be destroyed. The Bible tells us death is the absolute opposite to all that God has in mind for us. Is there not enmity there? Do you see the enmity? Do you understand why we're unpacking this enmity? This is what we're unpacking is the second last enmity that God will be dealing with. Buying and selling. You have to begin to understand how to buy this gold so you don't buy what the devil is offering. Does that make sense? People are saying, well, you know, this buying and selling, you know, it's all about buying materials and selling. They're going to take away credit cards. We're going to have a, a, a social crediting system. Yeah, that all is probably, they're working on it right now. But that is secondary to what Jesus wants you to buy in order to have eternal life. And now we understand this gold is faith tried in the fire to be tested. Every intelligent created being has to be tested. Do you love him? Do you trust him? Then you have to be like Shadrach or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I like the Hebrew names better. You have to stand and say, it doesn't matter what you offer, devil. That doesn't mean that later on in the future that this is going to happen. You kick on, oh, I better do what I was reading. No, it's that you begin right now with all your temptations, with all your infirmities, with all the things that the devil is throwing at you, you say, no, I'm going to stand with the Lord. And even if I get thrown in the fiery furnace to be tested, I know the Lord will deliver me. Because each little tiny test is going to prepare you for the major one. Death represents the reversal of everything God had in mind. And God told Adam and Eve, if you eat of this tree, you will die. So in that sense, that tree represented the very opposite to what the tree of life represented, enmity. Just as in our study in 318 of Revelation, buy from me gold tried in the fire, which we discover is faith, the gift of faith, is the opposite from Revelation 13, 17, that no one may either buy or sell what the devil is buying and selling. Does that make sense? Totally two opposite, complete trust in the Lord, faith tried in the fire would be what? Surrendering your will so you can buy and sell whatever. So you, you, you won't surrender your will so you will not buy and sell whatever this beast has to offer. Why does God test the people? Every single intelligent individual God has or had to test. Why? To see if the heart is going to obey the word of God. Right here. Remember, this is the word of God. This is what God does. He gives us this in order to have communion with him. Do you understand? Now, this is this is spiritual. Jesus wants to be with us physically, literally. Do you understand? So in order for that to take place, we have to obey his word. So when he comes here, he will be saying, true and faithful are my servants. And it's a guarantee he's going to have servants. It all depends on me deciding to be one of them. So the question is, who will be able to stand? Stand what? The great day of the Lord, those who pass the test will be able to stand. Even if you don't live in the very last days, the Lord tries his people. For what reason? You know what? For what reason? If you read there in Joel chapter 2, go to Joel chapter 2. Then the minor prophets. 
just before Amos, after Hosea, Joel chapter 2. Joel 2, verse 10 and 11 says, The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. You know what that is? That's that great and terrible day of the Lord. The Lord gives voice to his army, for his camp is very great. Guess what that camp is? <laughs> you know, those three Hebrew slaves, it looked like there in that si inside that palace were the minority. But do you know that they had all of heaven behind them? And the Babylonians were the minority. Jesus Christ stood with those men, and that was a majority. Those three Hebrew slaves that stood alone were the majority. That's what it's saying here in Joel for the very last days, that those very few who stand for the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ will have the whole heavenly host behind them. That's a promise. That is a beautiful promise. Do you understand that? Does that make sense? So even though there might be multitudes of people around you wanting to torment you and torture you, you, if you stand with the Lord, will be in the majority. That's a beautiful, it's a promise. It sits right here in Joel chapter two. The Lord gives his voice before his army for his camp is very great for strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can stand it? That's the question. And verses 12 and 13 gives the answer. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. So rend your heart and do and, and not your garments, not your filthy rags. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, so slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. There's the answer. Who is able to stand? Those who surrender their hearts to the Lord. You have to pass the test first. This is the buying of the gold, which is faith. Tried in the fire that you may be rich. Rich with what? With faith. How will we buy this faith then? It sounds like a price to pay. Isaiah 55 tells us. Isaiah 55 says this. How do you buy this then? Verses 1 to 3, it says, Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, Come and buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread? That's the word of God. You know what the milk is? You know what the wine is? We're going to find out in a minute here. And the wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully, carefully to me and eat what is good. And let your soul delight in itself, uh, delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David, indeed, I give them as a witness to the people. How do you buy this faith? Without money, without price, you come. To his word, it says there, eat the bread. This is how you obtain the faith that you need. Buying from gold, you buy it through his word. So that means you ask the Lord. You need to do this every day. You have to establish a relationship with the Father every day. And time is running out. Even us who think to be strong in faith, the time is running out. And that's what it says in Isaiah 55, verses 6 
to seven, it says, seek the Lord that while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and our God, for he will abundantly pardon. It's a free gift. This is how you buy gold tried in the fire. But what is the milk? You know, if you churn milk enough, you turn it. What does it turn into? It turns into butter. Guess what butter is? Let's go to Proverbs 30, verses 33. Proverbs 30, 33. What is this butter? If you have been foolish in exalting yourself, or if you have devised evil, put your hands to your mouth. For as the churning of the milk produces butter and ringing of the nose produces blood, so the forcing of wrath produces strife. The forcing or the, the producing of milk produces butter and the agitate the butter is in Isaiah 28, 10, which is the agitation of the word of God, which means that you have to agitate. You have to struggle with the word of God. Isaiah 28, 10, for precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, is the stammering of the word of God. The butter is the agitation of the word of God. Isaiah 7.15 also tells you that. Isaiah 7.15. Butter and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse evil and choose the good. And how do you do that? How do you know the difference between the word from precept upon precept, line upon line? Don't let those tell you that good is evil and evil is good. You stand by the word of God. How are you able to stand? By faith, tried in the fire that is given to you by the word of God. Does this make sense? Now, there's two processes of purifying, okay? And you find that in Malachi. The two processes of purifying is refiner and a purifier. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of what? Of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. The furnace is of the gold. The refining pot is of the silver. All right? Then there's two processes. And we find that in Proverbs 17, 17. So you will see that the emotional mind, let's go to Proverbs 17, uh, 3. Proverbs 17, 3. You understand we're building a case here. How do you buy from gold? What is the gold? How is it tried? It's in the fire. What is the fire? Do you see how we're answering these questions? 17, 3, Proverbs. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace is for gold. But the Lord, listen to this, tests the heart. Ah, so the refiner you'll see is the emotional mind. It's the heart. It's the emotional thinking. But it needs to be bridled. Emotions are great, but they're a terrible king. Does that, under, does that make sense? So purifier is to pur purify the moral command center, the forehead where Jesus wants to dwell. So guess what? You first have to allow the process of the gold to purify your moral command center so it's able to bridle the emotions, your heart. You know why? The furnace is for silver, right? The Or the furnace is for gold. The refining pot is for silver. And we discovered that gold is faith, but the Lord tests the heart. That's the silver. In these, in these uh, processes of, of refining you, Silver is your heart in the Bible. The gold is the moral command center where your faith begins. Does that make sense? And it needs to bridle your heart. Because why? Because the Lord, there's that word, tests the heart. He tests your heart. Do you trust him? Are you trusting him emotionally? Or are you an intelligent being who is allowing the devil to, to deceive you or allowing God? to drive him away, to say, no, the Bible is good. And what it says, I stand on. Does that make sense? Huh? So Jeremiah, 
Let's look at this silver a little bit. Jeremiah chapter 6, 27 and 30. Chapter 6, verses 27 and 30. I have set you as an as, as an assayer and as a fortress among my people that you may know and test their way. They are all stubborn rebels walking as slanders. They are bronze and iron. They are corruptors. The bellow blows fiercely. The lead is consumed by the fire. The smelters refine in vain for the wicked are drawn off. People will call them rejected silver because the Lord has rejected them. The heart in, Pro in Proverbs 17, oh no, Jeremiah 17 verses 9 and 10 says the Lord will test the mind and the heart and the heart is deceitful above all things and who can know it? Do you see the silver is the emotional thinking. The furnace is the gold that is placed here that bridles your heart, that you allow the Lord to guide you. Remember? So rereading re Malachi chapter 3, that they may, it says there in Malachi chapter 3, verse 3, that they may offer to the Lord an offering of righteousness. Pure silver is righteousness. So guess what is unpure silver? Unrighteousness. So we just discovered the Bible shows that silver is righteousness and that gold is faith tried in the fiery furnace to burn away all the base metals. That is the worldly passion and uh, passions. As a result, there is a pure goal, a pure faith, completely surrendering its will to the Lord. Therefore, the Laodicean people in these end times must be tested for what reason? Hmm? Righteousness by faith. Silver and gold. You are to buy, by careful study of the word, from Jesus Christ, gold tried in the fire, so that your heart, when it's tested, can stand the test and say, I will obey the Lord. That's righteousness by faith. The very last message to the world needs to be understood what righteousness by faith means. Faith in his word. Faith in his word and to bridle your emotions. What has gone awry in this world this, these days? The emotional mind is completely running this train straight into the devil's domain. And there is a coming a day you won't be able to buy from Jesus the gold tried in the fire. Did you know that? And the hearts and the minds of all the people in the world will have made their choice. Who are they going to serve? They will sell their hearts to the beast for a counterfeit righteousness, or they will choose to completely surrender their lives, including, including all their sins to Jesus Christ. So how are you able to stand? I can't read it all. Ephesians chapter six, verses 10 through 20. There's at least seven places there that says stand, stand, stand with the complete armor of God. This is the work we are not to save. We are not saved, though. Now, this is the thing. When we stand, is that work? Is it work? But we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. James chapter 4. We have to read this. James chapter 4. We're almost done. We're wrapping this up. James chapter 4, verses 18 to 26. No, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses, I'm sorry, chapter 2, 18 to 26, says, but someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you of my faith by my works. You believe there is one God, you do well, but even the demons believe and tremble, but you do but do you know, or do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he was when he offered Isaac his son to the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, 
and by works faith was made perfect and the scriptures was fulfilled which said abraham believed god and it was accounted to him for righteousness do you see righteousness by faith here and he was called the friend of god do you not want to be called the friend of god you see then that a man is justified <clears throat> excuse me justified by works and not by faith only likewise was rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent to them, out to them another way for the body without the spirit is dead so faith without works is dead also you are not saved by works but by faith every time you see the mighty ones of faith in scriptures especially in hebrews chapter 11 what were they doing abraham did something and it accounted to him for righteousness he had faith in the lord what were they doing what were they doing in order to build their faith that shows that they believed in the lord they were working do you believe me Everywhere, looking in Hebrews chapter 11, the, the, the Hebrews 11, listen to what it says. By verse, verse six, by without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who what? Who diligently seek him by faith. Verse seven, Noah. So by faith, Noah what? being divinely warned of things not yet seen. What is this? This is an adjective or a verb. Moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for saving of his household, by which he con uh, condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Did Noah do something? What did he do? He built the ark. Everywhere you read in there, the faith grows because why? Because they believed in the Lord and it accounted him for righteousness and they obeyed the Lord's word. You understand? By trusting the Lord, faith grows. And how do we grow this faith? How do we grow this faith? Last verse right here, Romans chapter 10. How do you grow the faith? Romans chapter 10. Yes. Yes, but then they say they did not all obey the gospel. For Isaiah says, the Lord who has believed our report, for who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and by hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17, by the word of God. In the end, when the examination of our records occurs for the living, what will be examined? When Jesus comes, he will give his reward to everyone according to their works. We are not, we are saved. Are we saved by our works? No, we are not saved by faith alone. We are not saved by works alone. And we're not saved by faith plus works. We are saved by a faith that works. Does that make sense? Because we are not saved by a faith that does not work. One of the reasons for the examination of the books is to see who really had the gold in Jesus tried in the fire, who really believed and trusted in him. And this is revealed in the actions of your life. We are saved by faith. We are judged by works. The works is the fruit of faith by his righteousness. Faith is the fruit of holiness. Romans chapter 6. I wasn't honest. This is the last one. Romans 6.22 says, But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. Faith is the fruit of holiness, and only the gospel can save us. I won't go into what Ellen White says, except the last thing. Our greatest need is faith in God. When we look on the dark side, we lose our hold on the Lord of Israel. As the heart is open to fears and conjectures, the path of progress is held up by unbelief. Let us never feel that God has forsaken his work. Do you understand? Never. 
When the woman in, with infirmities, she had an unmovable faith. Jesus insisted on knowing who had touched him. Finding concealment vain, she came forward trembling and cast herself at his feet with grateful tears. She had told the story of her suffering and how she had found relief. Jesus gently said, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith had made thee whole. Go in peace. It was not through the outward contact with him, but through the faith which took hold of his divine power that the cure was wrought. Finally, so what is this faith that is brought through his righteousness? It is not enough to believe about Christ. We must believe in him. The only faith that will benefit us is that which embraces him as a personal savior, which appropriates his merits to ourselves. Many hold faith as an opinion. Saving faith is a transaction by which those who receive Christ join themselves in covenant relationship with God. Genuine faith is life. A living faith means an increase of vigor, a confiding trust by which the soul becomes a conquering power. Who is able to stand? So what's the last enmity to be conquered? What's the second last one to be conquered? Well, the last one enmity is between the serpent and the seed. Because he will be cast. Remember the last moments of the day of atonement. He has to be cast in. And then death too. Afterwards, death. But once he's cast in, all the rest is going with him. Death in Hades is the very last thing that gets cast in the lake of fire. But we have already overcome by that point. There's no need to be having an enmity towards the devil. It just has to be eradicated. The, the sequence of the Day of Atonement has to be finished. But right now, what is the second to the last enmity be, to be conquered? Self. Self. Yourself. You have to surrender yourself completely to Jesus. Myself. Every day. See, I knew you weren't going to like it. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Everything that is confirmed, that is causing our infirmities, our distractions, our sadness, our brokenness, everything needs to be surrendered to the Lord. But first, give it to the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and then all his blessings will be added to you. Let us pray. It's time. Lord, Heavenly Father, I pray right now, Lord, that you guide us and lead us. Please, Lord, we're asking, can you please sell us this, this gold tried in the fire, Lord? Please, it sounds like we need to be tested so that we can be purified because the only way we're going to have pure gold is that if you purify it in the fire, Lord. So our trials, our temptations, our struggles, our lives... It's a blessing, Lord, because it's preparing us. It's getting us prepared. It's purifying our hearts and our minds so that we will be ready. So when we come to heaven, we will not be discouraged, but we'll be saying true is your word. And Lord, I pray that each one of us here is blessed. Bless us throughout the week, Lord. Please give us a desire to come back to your word and spend time chewing on those beautiful leaves, Lord, the bread of life. And I ask that you do that for us, each one of us here, in your precious son's name, the name above all names, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen.